Being no further introductions, it's now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, to the Premier, the Auditor General's Winter Road Maintenance Report stated that the cost for taxpayers for new plows and sanders was $15 million a year. Yep. However, the minister keeps saying the government is paying for a service. I'm going to be blunt. Services are intangible. Plowing the road, that's a service. Plows and sanders are tangible. They are equipment. If the government added 158 new vehicles, as they claim, they paid for equipment, not a service. Mr. Speaker, did the government pay for plows and sanders? And if they did, why do taxpayers not own them? I believe that the, the most important thing that we can do as a government is keep roads safe in this province. That's, that's the whole point of having these services, Mr. Speaker. And so the Leader of the Opposition, if, he, if he's proposing that the services— I'm going to ensure that I hear the questions today, and if the talking continues even when I'm standing, I'll go into warnings. Carry on. If he's proposing that the services that are provided, member from Leeds Grenville, come to order. Some respect, the services that are provided by the contractors are not critical. Then I think he needs to look again at what's needed on our roads, Mr. Speaker. So, our government has the uh, highest level of standards. Our record of having either the the safest or the second safest roads in North America for the last 13 years, Mr. Speaker. That is the point. We're Answer. ensuring that the roads and highways that our families uh, in the province rely on are well maintained and are safe, Mr. Speaker. We made changes to the maintenance contracts that required contractors to improve service levels and to add equipment, Mr. Speaker. That was part of the contract. That was part of the contract Thank that you. was signed with the. People who provide this service. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, and as usual, the government is scrambling to get their story straight. The Minister of Transportation is a lawyer and would know the difference between a contract for a service and a contract to purchase equipment. So let me put it this way. I've never heard of anyone who hires a contractor, like a carpenter, who also has to buy a hammer to, for them to get the job done. It makes no sense for the government to have hired snow plowing companies to plow the roads, then to have to purchase for them the plow plows and the, and the sanders to do the job. Wow. Mr. Speaker, the government took the lowest bidder when the next highest bidder had enough equipment to do the job. Why did the Liberals require the winning bidders to have enough equipment to do the job? Such a basic concept. So, Mr. Speaker, we made we made changes to the maintenance contracts, as I said, that required contractors to improve their service and to add equipment, Mr. Speaker. That was part of the contract. The improved service levels mean that new contracts will have the same amount of equipment, if not more, Mr. Speaker. So that is part of the, part of the contract. Those are part of the terms of the contract. Our highway um, maintenance action plan is our next step in making, uh, making road conditions better, improving the Ontario 511 website, launching a track my plow program in the Owen Sound and Simcoe areas with further expansion so, so people can know where the plowing is being done, Mr. Speaker. We're increasing the use of anti-icing liquids uh, before winter storms. And Mr. Speaker, I will just say to the member opposite, again, the level of service member is from what Leeds is critical. Grenville, second the time. standards are what is and critical. Sir? We have ensured in the contracts that the equipment levels were increased and that those, in, those equipment levels stay high. The member, the member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke will come to order. The member from Renfrew Nipissing uh, Pembroke is warned. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, uh, well, I'm asking you to stop. Then that's what you're going to get. And anyone else that decides to do that gets it today. Carry on. Mr. Speaker, again for the Premier, the snow job of spin doesn't add up. Right. The Auditor General Minister of Agriculture, come to order. the cost for new equipment was nearly $15 million. On Monday, the Transportation Ministry said they didn't buy plows. Yesterday, they claimed they added 158 new vehicles. Your story changes by the day. Once again, we see when the government gets caught red-handed, they can't get their story straight. Last time, it was money taken out of the classrooms. This time, it's money taken from road safety. It's time Minister of Education, come to order. To clear up the confusion 
confusion that her transportation minister has caused. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier tell us, was the Auditor General wrong when she said the Liberals paid for new equipment, or did the Liberals mislead the Auditor General? The member will withdraw. Withdraw. Premier. So, Speaker, um, so the standards that are in place are among the highest in North America, which is why our roads for 13 years have been the safest or the second safest in the province. Mr. Speaker, there are children in this uh, ga in the galleries today, and I want to say to those children, because I have grandchildren, Mr. Speaker, I was the Minister of Transportation. I sure that the standards that we have in place are the highest possible, Mr. Speaker. We have stuck to those standards, and I will say— I'm moving to warnings. To be safe on the roads, Mr. Speaker, whether they're in cars or whether they're in buses, Mr. Speaker. And let me tell the member opposite, one of the conversations that we had— the member from Lanark, Ron Lennox, and Annington is warned. Carry on. One of the conversations that we had when I was Minister of Transportation is, in fact, that we are adapting to new weather conditions. Ms. The member from Leeds Grenville is warned. Well, and I hear the heckling from the other side. Oh, new weather conditions, Mr. Speaker. The reality is, the reality is. The member from Kitchener Conestoga is warned. We are seeing the effects of climate change across this country, Mr. Speaker, and we are working on it. It is very important that we have the right equipment, that we have the right amount of de-icing fluid, Mr. Speaker. Things are changing in the north, in the south, Mr. Speaker, and across the globe. And if the people opposite don't want to acknowledge that, the children in the gallery certainly do. Thank you. You see it, please? You see it, please? Here. Final supplement. Oh, sorry, new question. Speaker, again to the Premier, since I can't get a straight answer on the transportation file, let's try health care. I want to share with you the effects that the Liberal government's cuts are having on doctors. I will share with you uh, what was uh, written by Dr. Priya Sopel a family doctor for the last 22 years in Brampton. She says patient care will be compromised. Patients will have to wait. Patients will not hear a familiar voice at the other end of the phone. Excuse me. Deputy Premier is warned. Carry on. They will no longer have a dedicated person at, the, at the, each office doing referrals to ensure, ensure patients are seen in a timely manner. She said if the Ministry of Health thinks that cuts will not affect patient care, they are wrong. Mr. Speaker, is Dr. Sapala Brampton wrong when she says the government's cuts are going to affect patient care? Mr. Speaker. I will just say to the uh, Leader of the Opposition, I know that the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care is going to want to, uh, to weigh on in this because he is in conversation with the OMA, Mr. Speaker. We value our doctors in this province, Mr. Speaker. That's why, that's why we have increased health care funding every year, Mr. Speaker, increased health care funding across the board, Mr. Speaker. We know that there are challenge that, challenges that are faced by the health care system. We know we have an aging demographic, Mr. Speaker. We know that doctors obviously are a fundamental part of the delivery of, uh, of health care, Mr. Speaker. We've engaged with doctors. The Leader of the Opposition is asking that and believes that we should be paying doctors more, Mr. Speaker. They are the highest paid uh, physicians in the country, Mr. Speaker. And so that is evidence of how much we value Answer. them. We will continue to work with the OMA, Mr. Speaker, because we do value them so highly. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier. What I'm saying is that you can't take $800 million out of the health care system and think it doesn't affect patient care. Dr. Sapel continues, they will not be able to offer blood work to their patients. They will no longer be able to call patients to remind them of their upcoming appointments. They will no longer be able to deal with prescription renewals over the phone or fax. 
The staff will be rushed and appear not to care. But unlike the Premier, Dr. Sapel and her staff do care. They care about patients. Mr. Speaker, why does the Premier have to, what does the Premier have to say to Dr. Sapel and her patients? Should they ignore your cuts? And don't pass the buck to the health minister. There's not a single doctor in this province that supports these cuts. The uh, Deputy House Leader is warned. Carry on. On term care. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, I'm extremely proud of the fact that since we came into office in 2003, we've increased the supply of physicians in this province by 26 per cent. More than 5,000 new doctors are, pro are practicing here. That's, when you compare that with the growth in population, the growth in population over that time has been roughly 10 per cent. So we've been adding doctors and continue to add doctors at the rate of 700 net new doctors each and every year, and that's important so we continue to provide that important frontline care. And consistent with that increase in flow of doctors uh, providing that frontline care, we've every single year since we've been in office, we've increased the budget for physician services, as we should, to take into account the growing population, the changing demographics. Answer. We increased the, uh, the uh, budget last year for physicians. This year, next year, I ex expect that will continue into the future. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again, back to the Premier, you know, to, to hear this spin again and again and again, what I have not heard is an example of a single doctor. There's 26,000 doctors in Ontario. One example. Give us one doctor outside this legislature who actually supports your cuts. You know, it's, it's bad enough. It's bad enough when this government has done to family doctors. But they're hurting entire regions. You know, Linda Silas, president of the Canadian Federation of Nurses, said in North Bay and across northern Ontario, we are seeing severe cuts. North Bay Regional Health Centre was forced to cut almost 160 positions and close more than 30 beds in an attempt to stave off the flood of red ink. Sudbury and District Health Unit laid off four more employees just last month. Question. Dr. Andrew Tu from Timmins has warned doctors will leave the city because of the cuts. You think this is all a joke? You are hurting and damaging health care. How do you defend it? How do you justify it? Thank you. Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, I mean, it's true that after a more than 60 percent increase in their compensation yes. over the last decade, yes. we have asked our doctors yes. to take a modest uh, compensation change so that we can make that difficult but important choice to invest in home and community care, yes. to invest in mental health services in the community, to invest in increased wages for our PSWs. Those are difficult decisions to make, but I believe that they're the right decisions for this province, and it's in the, in the context, Mr. Speaker, of their there is no cap on any individual doctor's uh, billings. We're, we are never going to ask them to work for free. We're going to pay them for every single service that they provide, and there is no impact on health services because we're asking for that modest change uh, over this difficult time so we can invest in those, those health care issues in the, in the, in the province, sir? Mr. Speaker, that I know our doctors support, and many of them, many of them have come to me and express their support for those investments. Thank you. All right, new question. The member from Bramley Gormont. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Today, Ontario's Auditor General will be reporting on Hydro One. Sadly, because of this Liberal government's decision, this will be the very last time it's going to happen. Because when the Premier decided to sell off Hydro One, she changed the rules so that the Auditor General of Ontario can no longer report on Hydro One. Can the Premier explain why she thinks that the Hydro One doesn't deserve independent public oversight? So, Mr. Speaker, the, um, the member opposite knows full well that there, uh, there are other oversight mechanisms that are in place for a, a publicly owned company uh, that, that, that Hydro One will be, Mr. Speaker, once we broaden the ownership uh, of Hydro One. And, Mr. Speaker, in terms of what the auditor is, is or is not going to say, I'm not going to weigh into that. She will be tabling her report uh, around 11.30, I believe, Mr. Speaker. And, you know, the job of the Auditor General is to look at government and to look at uh, the way services are provided and to look at the
the way uh, government functions and to, uh, to provide a, a critique of that. And we welcome that. We will work with the Auditor General, whatever her, uh, whatever her report says, Mr. Speaker. And it is, it is a healthy aspect of democracy that we have that kind of objective assessment of how government operates. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Mr. Speaker, that healthy part of this democracy is something that this Premier is stripping from the province of Ontario. Ontario has an Auditor General whose job it is to make sure that public money is properly spent and to raise alarm bells when it's not properly spent. Sadly, the Premier decided that public independent oversight of Hydro One is no longer necessary. Will the Premier tell the people of Ontario why her commitment to transparency doesn't extend to Hydro One? Mr. Speaker, as I, again, as I said, the, uh, the member opposite knows that a publicly traded company has different oversight mechanisms in place than, uh, than, a, a, government, than a Crown Corporation, and um, Hydro One will remain regulated, but there will be different, different oversight mechanisms. Um, what, what will be in place, Mr. Speaker, is an ombudsperson, and in fact, the person who's been hired to do that is, uh, is Fiona Crean, Mr. Speaker, and I know that Ms. Crean will report directly to the Board of Directors in order to and ensure independence and to allow the board to provide uh, strong support for any recommendation made. And I think that I think that there are members of the uh, third party who have in fact lauded uh, Fiona Crean in the past for work that she has done. So I'm sure that they're supportive of that appointment. We've also asked Denny uh, Deshotel, former Auditor General of Canada, Answer. to oversee the establishment of the Ombudsperson's Office to ensure that transparency and accountability is in place. Thank you. A final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, none of this oversight that the Premier is talking about is publicly funded by the people of Ontario, and that's why it's unacceptable. It's ironic that the auditor is reporting on Hydro One today. It's ironic because it was six months ago that the Auditor General and seven other legislative officers responsible for oversight called on the Premier to stop this process of eliminating the public oversight of Hydro One. Ontarians can count on the auditor to give them the facts that the Premier would rather never see the light of day. Whether it's the cost of gas plants, the Orange Air ambulance scandal, the waste of $8 billion for sweetheart P3 deals, or the truth about privatized road maintenance. Why did the Premier eliminate public independent oversight of Hydro One? Question. Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, um, I think the uh, I think the the member opposite knows that uh, we remain committed to Hydro One's continued regulation, to accountability and transparency. It will be a different it will be a different kind of organization. There's no doubt about it. It will be a publicly traded company, Mr. Speaker. It'll continue to be governed by uh, Ontario laws, including the Business Corporations Act and the Securities Act. It'll continue to file information with the uh, Ontario Securities Commission. And in addition, Hydro One will annually disclose its compensation of the CEO. Every member of the board of directors the chief financial officer and the three uh, other highest paid executives of the corporation. Mr. Speaker, we are making a change. There is no doubt about that. We are making this change because we need to invest in infrastructure in this province. Now, the third party does not support the investment of infrastru in infrastructure yes, in the province. That's the reality because they yep. don't support funding it. If you don't support funding it, you don't Thank support you. the investment in the building, Mr. Speaker. Good question. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. My next question is again to the Premier. It's been almost one year since Bill 15, fighting fraud and reducing auto insurance, passed in this House. But many people in Ontario will tell you that they're certainly not paying any less for insurance. The Liberals made a promise, a commitment to Ontarians to reduce auto insurance rates by 15 per cent by last August. They haven't even reached half of that target. They've broken that promise, Mr. Speaker. They've broken that commitment. Our insurance system is broken, and the government has not prioritized fixing it. They simply can't be trusted to fix this problem. When will the rates come down by the 15 per cent promised by this government? Well, Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the
member opposite knows, and I know that the Minister of Finance will want to weigh in on this, but the member of, of the uh, third party knows that, on average, uh, insurance rates have come down over 6 per cent. Mr. Speaker, we are still working with the industry to make sure that we do everything we can to, uh, to continue those reductions. But, Mr. Speaker, those reductions are, on average, they are across the driving population. So, in fact, there are people who have seen their insurance rates go down, Mr. Speaker. I have had people in my own constituency in constituency office who have come in and told us that their insurance rates have gone down. But, Mr. Speaker, one of the things that we know is that when there's an average, not everyone will see exactly the same impact. So we're going to continue to work to remove fraud from the system, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that people continue get to, to get the protections that they need. But, Mr. Speaker, it yes, does sir. take time. It is on average across the whole driving population, and we're working with industry. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, the Premier knows that a promise was made to reduce insurance rates by 15 per cent. The Premier knows that this promise was broken. The Premier knows that this promise was not even achieved by half. The Premier knows that they cannot do the job of fixing this problem. It's been on In addition to this problem of not reaching the 15 per cent reduction, the government has thrown the insurance industry into chaos. When the problems with Bill 15 were were raised that without clarifying when a certain clause would apply, they plunged the system into chaos. There's hundreds and thousands of dollars of court challenges of a simple clause, whether or not Bill 15 applies retroactively or whether it applies from January 1st moving forward. This government purposely excluded this clarifying point, plunging the system into chaos. Question. They've withdrawn our services, withdrawn coverage, cut benefits, and now plunge the system into chaos. When will the Thank Premier you. follow through on the promise to reduce insurance by 15 percent? Mr. Finance. Mr. Finance. Mr. Speaker, just this spring, and despite strong objections as it's coming right now from the opposition, we have passed new rate-reducing legislation that will benefit drivers soon, notwithstanding the fact that they've initiated delays enabling us to actually get those rates reduced. In the meantime, re re reductions have occurred. They are continuing because of some of the very programs that we put in place, including trying to expedite matters more quickly for the benefit of those that are victims and for those that are requiring the benefit. And that's exactly where we want the money to go. And that's exactly what we're doing. The member opposite voted against those measures, Mr. Speaker, and now he has the audacity to stand here and demand more. Uh, to make it clear, my resolve has not changed from this morning. Final supplementary. So this government has plunged the insurance situation into chaos by not clarifying on when the regulatory changes will take effect. They've created whole, increased uh, courtroom expenses. From 2010 to 2014, insurance premiums rose dramatically, accident benefits were slashed, and their benefits were clawed back even further as a result of Bill 15. Independent studies show that the liberal changes to the insurance regime in Ontario have resulted in drivers overpaying by $1.5 billion. The same report also shows that the insurance profitability has reached nearly double the levels deemed reasonable. It's clear that by slashing benefits, by cutting coverage, the insurance industry is benefiting tremendously because of this, but this Liberal government. But Ontario drivers are not seeing any of those savings. Is the Premier giving up on her promise to Question. reduce insurance premiums by 15 per cent and instead continuing to benefit insurance companies and not the drivers of this province? So, Mr. Speaker, rates are going down. They would have gone down a lot faster and a lot more dramatically had the members opposite supported the initiatives from the beginning. Furthermore, Mr. Speaker, we have a competitive system. There are a number of companies already providing reduced rates. As a result of winter tires and so forth that we provided, there are a number of them that are providing already 50 percent reductions. We encourage those that are watching and elsewhere to make those calls and do a, a competitive analysis because there are opportunities available. But, Mr. Speaker, once again, we have conditions. We have to lower the costs. The member opposite and his party have obstructed the very initiatives to reduce costs in the system to enable premiums to go down. We'll fight for the drivers. We'll fight for our, the people of Ontario to have reduction in those costs by initiating the very measures that we put in place, notwithstanding that they're voting against those very measures, Mr. Speaker. No question. The member from Oxford. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. The minister says he hasn't heard any complaints about the Housing Service Corporation, but he received the Mer Meritorious letter this year that said 
It cost Toronto Community Housing $6.3 million more for natural gas. The minister says I won't acknowledge their independent review. But I've talked about that review and pointed out that it didn't solve the problem, and it didn't look at how much HSC is costing housing providers. He says the problem is history, but housing providers are still paying too much for natural gas insurance this year, and Housing Services Corporation is spending money on trips to Europe this year. Could the minister tell us why he is still forcing social housing providers to waste money that could otherwise provide housing for people in need? Thank you. Mr. Minister, well, I'll try again, Mr. Speaker, this was a bill that was uh, original, originally fronted by the uh, the party opposite. They put the member from Oxford is warned. Did I detect a challenge to the chair? Carry on. We did make the bill uh, and the operation of the HSC more accountable. We discovered as part of a review that we put in place that there were some problems. We conducted an independent review. That review came back and made a series of recommendations, all of which are being implemented. And, and we, on balance, are satisfied that we're making very good progress on the HSC front. Which, by the way, I should remind you, the assembly through you, Mr. Speaker, is an independent uh, corporation that makes independent uh, decisions. Notwithstanding that, yes, they work with us around an, an independent review, and we're satisfied with the results. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary, the member from Prince Edward Hastings. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this is clearly a problem right across the province, and if the member wants to stand up and blow his own horn, he should join a brass band because clearly. <laughs> isn't working for communities across Ontario. This year, this year, Mr. Speaker, in Hastings County, they would have saved $40,000 if they didn't have to buy natural gas through the Housing Services Corporation. A couple of years ago, the Eastern Ontario Warden's Caucus reported that they would have saved 31% if they didn't have to purchase through the Housing Services Corporation. You can do what this government always does, and we just heard what this government always does. They set up a framework to establish a review have three press conferences, but what they really should be doing, Mr. Speaker, is deliver some action for communities across Ontario. Minister, when are you going to let these Question. communities opt out? Counties like Hastings ca can't, and they want to deliver better, lower-cost social housing for Ontario's most vulnerable. Minister. Well, Speaker, I, I already belong to a brass band, so I don't need to join one. Um, <laughs> But I do want, I do want to say that uh, the, the foundational argument of pooling so that, so that ev everyone benefits ideally together, uh, not at the expense of you know, one, one benefiting at the expense of all, is a sound principle. It's one I applaud the uh, government opposite for. You can take a snapshot, and these are snapshots that are being taken by members opposite, any point in time to, to show what you want. But if you look at it over the fullness, or the whole scope of the activities, and you speak to the service uh, managers directly, as I have done on several occasions, you discover something, something that you may be surprised to hear. They're relatively satisfied with HSC and the job they're doing. Thanks very much. Thank you. Your question, the member from London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Yesterday, respected violence against women experts and frontline agencies came to Queen's Park. They warned that arbitrarily reducing the Partner Assault Response Program from 16 weeks to 12 weeks is unethical and puts the safety of women and children at risk. In response, the Attorney General said 12 weeks is better than zero weeks. Speaker, violence against women advocates and women who want the abuse to stop deserve an apology for these shameful and insulting comments. Will the Premier ask the Attorney General to apologize, and will her government finally listen to experts and leaders across the sector who are unanimous in calling for an immediate halt to the changes to PAR? So, Mr. Speaker, 
You know, um, I just I just want to make it clear that everyone on this side of the house is very very concerned about the services that are provided. We're concerned about the issues that lead to the need for these services, Mr. Speaker. And obviously, we want to have in place services that will help people to stop these behaviors, Mr. Speaker. We want effective services and programs that will allow people, uh, allow women to live uh, free of violence and allow allow uh, perpetrators to change their behaviors. Those are complicated but very, very important programs, Mr. Speaker. So the, uh, the fact of the, uh, the PAR program, uh, we know that it has had success, Mr. Speaker, and we are looking at the evidence. We are looking at what we need to do to make sure that we, continu we continue to deliver those services in the best yes, way sir. possible so that these behaviors will stop, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Speaker, reducing the only government program for men who abuse without any evidence to support the change is a failure of leadership for women and children. Yeah. Yesterday's comments by the Attorney General completely undermine the government's credibility on ending violence against women. If the only justification for reducing the length of the PAR program was to create additional spaces, can the Premier explain why 2,000 of the 2,200 new spaces remain unfilled? Why is she using flawed data to push through these changes and ignoring the advice of experts and her own roundtable on violence against women who are calling for meaningful consultation? on a review of PAR. Well, Mr. Speaker, first of all, the member opposite knows that there was not a cut to the funding of the PAR program. There was a change. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I'm quite happy to acknowledge that there may be a problem. I'm quite happy to acknowledge that there may need to be a change. But I am not going to engage in a discussion when the facts are not on the table. There has not been a cut. There was a reorganization of the program. And Mr. Speaker, there is a review going on. If we need to make a change to that, if we need to, if we need to change the decision, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that the right processes and the right services are in place, then we will do that. Mr. Speaker, remember, this is the government that has brought in the toughest, the toughest policy on sexual assault and violence in the history of the province, Mr. Speaker. We're going to continue on that record. You say anything, please? New question. The member from Ottawa, Orléans. Monsieur le Président. Thank you. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier as Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs. The world has turned its attention squarely to Paris, France, as the United Nations Climate Change Conference unfolds. Leaders from all over the world have come together to work towards a common solution to one of the, if not the biggest challenge facing the global community today. Because of the leadership at the federal and provincial levels, there is a real opportunity to take action in the fight against climate change. Au Canada, le Premier ministre Trudeau a signé Prime Minister Trudeau said that we would take our international status as leaders. We've done to reduce our emissions. We have already seen a global leaders in the fight against climate change. My question, Mr. Speaker, Question. can the Premier, who is leading the Ontario delegation, please inform this House on what is happening at COP21 in Merci. Paris? Merci pour, uh, cette question. Thank you for that question, Mr. Speaker. Climate change is not a problem for the future, it is a problem today, Mr. Speaker. Her responsibility in this province, in this country, all of us as uh, leaders of jurisdictions have a responsibility to take on this great challenge, Mr. Speaker. I'm very proud of the steps that Ontario has taken so far, Mr. Speaker, shutting down the coal-fired plants, the largest single action in North America to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, Mr. Speaker. And it was a privilege for me to be in Paris to work with 
premiers from across the country and with the Prime Minister to talk about and to offer what we have done to the global community, Mr. Speaker. That's what COP21 is about. It's about different jurisdictions coming together to share their experiences, to learn from each other, Mr. Speaker, and to encourage one another to take further Answer. action. Yeah. So, Mr. Speaker, I'm very, very pleased to say that having a federal government that is now working with us on this challenge Thank is you. a great, great boon for the project. Merci à la première ministre. Thanks for the premier. Presented on the world stage, an important component in the fight against climate change is making sure that there is cooperation among the global community. We know that this cooperation also needs to happen at the sub-national level. In Canada, provincial governments and municipalities have demonstrated strong leadership and an ability to make positive change when it comes to combating climate change. That expertise at the local level needs to be shared with other jurisdictions, and we have a great opportunity to learn from others as well. Because there is a shared global problem, there need to be a cooperation and collaboration among provinces, states, cities, towns, etc. Mr. Speaker, can the Premier please inform the House on how sub-national governments are taking part in the UN summit? Like I said, all states, provinces, territories, uh, and countries uh, must uh, work together to improve the situation. Mr. Speaker, it, uh, what we need is, uh, is all of the federal governments, all of the sub-national governments, and by that I mean, I mean states, I mean provinces, I mean cities and communities, Mr. Speaker. We all have a responsibility, and there is always something that we can do. I had the opportunity to listen to some of the leaders of very small island nations, Mr. Speaker, and they are experiencing, as are uh, jurisdictions in the far north in, uh, in Canada, they're experiencing already ready the impacts of climate change, Mr. Speaker. They're having to move people away from the, the coastlines of their Answer. countries in order for people to uh, 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 be safe from flooding, Mr. Speaker. So having the federal government working with the sub-national governments, that's the Thank way you. that we can have an impact on the global uh, climate change. Thank you. 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 My question is for the Premier. Premier, last week you released your much ballyhooed uh, Save the Earth climate change strategy. 37 pages. 37 pages, long on self-praise, short on details, but barely a mention of the word nuclear. Premier, nuclear, power provi nuclear provides 60 per cent of our province's power. It is clean, emission-free, reliable and affordable. But our nuclear units are aging and in need of refurbishment. Many, many of them are in need of refurbishment. We're hearing nothing from your government on this issue. Our ability to provide emission-free power depends on our nuclear fleet, uh, nuclear fleet operating efficiently. Premier, when can we hear from the government as to show some support for the nuclear industry like you show for some of your other chosen forms of generation? When can we hear some support and a plan for ensuring that Ontario will have emission-free nuclear power for decades? Thank you. Premier. Speaker, I think this is a friendly question because, Mr. Speaker, if you look at our long term energy plan, the member opposite will see that uh, nuclear forms the base load well into the future, Mr. Speaker. We have no intention of moving away from the base load of nuclear. And we know full well that that means the refurbishment of, uh, of our nuclear stock, Mr. Speaker. So uh, I'm not sure exactly where the member opposite is going. Maybe he just wanted to be able to ask a question that had some notion of climate change in it, so he thought he'd throw in that word. We're keeping nuclear, Mr. Speaker. It's the base load of this province. You say that, please? You say that, please? Thank you. Supplementary. Hey, uh, I've asked for attention here. Supplementary, please. Well, the Premier loves to throw pot shots at people that don't necessarily agree with everything she says. But the reality is this, Speaker. The reality is this. She can talk all she wants. She can talk all she wants, but until they actually do something to ensure that our nuclear fleet will be operating well into the next several decades, then we have a problem. Because if that schedule is not a, an efficient one, we will see 
Sorry, the, mem the Minister of Economic Development is warned. Carry on. We will see greenhouse gas emissions rise in this province dramatically. If our nuclear fleet has units taken down simultaneously, we will not be able to provide that emission-free power that Ontario depends so much upon. So it's not just, it's not just weasel words for nuclear. Stand up and in put out a schedule as to when refurbishment will take place, because that is necessary in this province. First of all, I would like to try to talk to the member, and that is to caution him on some of the language he was using. And now that he's done what he's done, I just want to remind him that there are some W's that are on my list of people who are already warned. And I've heard now twice a word that is unparliamentary, and I won't hear it again. And if I do, they will be named. If you don't trust my resolve, I'm telling you. Premier. Mr. Speaker, we are moving ahead with refurbishment. Uh, that's, that's the answer to the, uh, the member opposite's question. In fact, the planned refurbishments will create almost 25,000 jobs. They generate $5 billion annually in economic activity, Mr. Speaker. Um, we're moving ahead with significant steps right now to ensure that the refurbishment of Darlington and Bruce are done right. So, so that refurbishment is in the planning stages, Mr. Speaker. So the, the member opposite just has to look at our long-term energy plan to know that we're serious. We're in the process of, uh, of putting that uh, refurbishment in place. And, Mr. Speaker, I, I applaud the member opposite for supporting our support and our plan to refurbish and to keep uh, nuclear as our baseload, Mr. Speaker. The Minister of Research and Innovation was talking with the Nuclear Association this morning. Answer. So, Mr. Speaker, I would encourage the member opposite to take yes for an answer. Thank you. Any question, the member from Hamilton Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Premier, as you know, the Auditor General is releasing her report on SAMS today. New Democrats obtained through FOI the Ministry's internal audit of SAMS. From that audit, I'll quote, we were unable to obtain information that the SAMS project has addressed the 2009 Auditor General's findings regarding deficiencies, end of quote. And another quote, the 2009 AG findings may lead to the same findings being reported for SAMS in future AG reports, end of quote. Speaker, my question is simple. Will the AG report find that the minister has failed to deal with any of the AG's findings from 2009? So, Mr. Speaker, as I said earlier, the Auditor General has not yet tabled her report, and we uh, we look forward to that, Mr. Speaker. I know that the Minister of Community and Social Services will want to weigh in on what has already uh, happened with SAMS. But, Mr. Speaker, let me repeat what I said earlier, and that is that it is the Auditor General's job to look at government, to look at the services, to look at the way uh, services are delivered, Mr. Speaker, and to have an opinion about the way uh, money is spent. And that that is a very good thing, Mr. Mr. Speaker, it's very good in a democracy to have those objective eyes on what we do. But her job is to find problems that need to be resolved. We look forward to working with the Auditor General, as we have in the past, Mr. Speaker, to uh, to deal with the issues that she identifies, to work with her, to make yes, sure that we are providing services in the best way possible for the people of Ontario. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, according to the ministry's own audit, the government has not dealt with the AG's report from five years ago. The audit also laid out it's their report that we FOI. The, the chair, audit please. also laid out serious concerns about SAMS, meaning the minister was well aware of the issues before its disastrous implementation. The audit references expected delays to the project timelines. Sound familiar? We know countless vulnerable Ontarians expe experience these delays. Some, they faced evictions, and others, just straight-out check delays. 
We know frontline workers were forced to shoulder the brunt of the technical programs of SAMS, and they're currently still facing those problems. Speaker, again, will today's AG report show that the government continues Question. to ignore concerns raised by the AG's report five years ago? Yes. Mr. Speaker, we are going to wait for the Auditor General's report. The member opposite asks what the AG's report will show us. We're going to wait until she tables it. And in fact, Mr. Speaker, the, ma the member knows that the auditor has um, publicly published which areas she'd be reviewing as part of her report. She hasn't tabled her report. She'll be doing that uh, after question period, Mr. Speaker. And actually, she's asked. She actually asked that uh, the uh, the briefing that is going on right now that the uh, issues not be released publicly, Mr. Speaker, that that not be disclosed before she has a chance to table her report. So so we're going to give her that opportunity, Mr. Speaker. And the fact is, it is her job to look at government, to critique, to bring object objectivity, and to look at what uh, what government has done. And it is our job as government, Mr. Answer. Speaker, to respond, to work with the Auditor General as we have in the past, and we will continue to do that, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. New question, the member from Newmarket, Aurora. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Citizenship, Immigration, and International Trade. Speaker, Ontario's trade strategy helps companies export to global markets, which creates jobs here in Ontario. To reach this goal, it's important we reach out to the growing and emerging global markets. Ontario has reaped great benefits from the, from the government's trade missions, which help forge and strengthen trade relationships around the world. In fact, right. Mr. Speaker, last fall, the Premier's mission to China secured almost $1 billion in investment wow. and over 1,000 jobs for Ontarians. Wow. Speaker, I know the Premier and Minister recently returned from another trade mission to China, along with the Minister of Economic Development. Can the Minister tell us more about the results of this most recent trade mission? Thank you, Minister of Citizenship, Immigration and International Trade. Thank you, thank you, Speaker, and thank you for the question. I want to thank the Honourable Member from Newmarket and Aurora for asking. Speaker, early November this year, Premier Wynne led a trade mission to China. Speaker, we all know that China plays a critical role in the global economy and continues to outpace other emerging markets. Speaker, Ontario has strong innovation capabilities in key sectors that are complementary to China. This is why the recent Premier's trade mission to China has been such a huge, huge success. Over the course of the mission, Ontario delegates signed more than 100 agreements with an estimated value of 2.5 billion, oh. and deals may create as many as 1,700 jobs. Answer. It was a very successful mission, and I look forward to do more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I agree with the minister. It's critical to the growth of our economy to identify potential markets uh, and promote Ontario abroad. Attracting new investment and helping the province's businesses compete globally is part of this government's plan to boost Ontario's economy. It's also part of our efforts to invest in people's talents and skills and create a dynamic, innovative environment where business thrives. I'm proud of our uh, Ontario businesses and the high quality of products that they produce. That's why uh, last year's trade mission to China was such a success. It allowed Ontario's businesses connect to connect directly with important international markets. Speaker, could the minister please expand on how this government is connecting Ontarians with global markets? How are we doing that? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Speaker. The member is right, Speaker. Trade mission are the best way for us to connect Ontario businesses with the international markets. This is why we work to promote Ontario in many different countries. Speaker, I also just returned from a trade mission to Germany. Wow. There, I participated in many, many key events that will lay the groundwork for successful future missions. I attended medical trade, trade zone, was able to visit our sister province, Baden-Württemberg, met with Festo Automation, as well as Bayer Healthcare, where an Ontario startup from Kitchener and Waterloo won the grants for apps competition. Speaker, it is important to promote and sell Ontario around the world. And sir? This government is working hard to do so. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. New question, the member from Bruce Owen Sound. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is the Associate Minister of Long-Term Care. 
Your government has spent 12 years studying, reviewing and planning the redevelopment of long-term care homes. You also promised to develop 30,000 beds so as to ensure safe living environments for our frail seniors. Yet today, after years of shameful neglect and scarce funding, your government has left our long-term care homes crumbling and 25,000 frail seniors without a long-term care bed. The associate minister keeps saying that despite all these facts, there really is a plan. So through you, Mr. Speaker, I ask the minister, how many organizations will be approved in the first round of the capital renewal program? When will construction begin? And how many of the promised 30,000 beds will be built in round one? Where are they going to be? Thank you. Associate Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I thank the member opposite for this question because it certainly gives me an opportunity to talk about all of the good work we are doing in redevelopment. As I've mentioned many times, Mr. Speaker, there are so many examples that I can share with this House about the redevelopment that are taking place as we speak. In fact, Mr. Speaker, I, last time when I answered this question, I spoke about the redevelopment, the brand new facility in Oshawa that I was there for the inauguration. And what a wonderful event that was. But, Mr. Speaker, we are not resting on our laurels. We are moving ahead. So let me speak about a brand new redevelopment that is taking place as we speak in Thunder Bay. It's a state-of-the-art facility with over 500 new with over 500 beds, including about 38 new beds and the redevelopment of over 450 beds. Just yes, one example, Mr. Speaker, of the redevelopment that is going on in this province. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Associate Minister of Long Term Care. Enough of the platitudes. It sounds like your only plan for your government is to wheel out the frail seniors to the end of the curve and say, We're done with you. Experts tell us the long term care system is creeping up to the brink of crisis as the wait list will double to at least 50,000 seniors in just six years. So not only is this government failing seniors today, but it's also ill prepared to meet this looming demographic crisis going forward. Again, where is the plan? Would the minister please tell the House, here and now, how many new long-term care beds are going to be built in the next five years, and where in Ontario will they be built? Where is the plan? Thank you. Where is the plan? Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think the proof is in the pudding. So let me talk about close to 500 new beds that we brought online in just the last three, four months. I was in uh, Waterloo recently, along with members from Kitchener Waterloo, Kitchener Conestoga, and Wellington Halton Hills, who were there to witness the opening of a brand new facility, brand new beds right here in Waterloo, Mr. Speaker. Before that, I was in Windsor in the fall for the uh, opening of another facility facility, close to 200 brand new beds. Just examples of the fact that new beds are coming online as we speak and will continue to come online as required. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Morrison, member from Algoma, Manitoulin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and good morning to you. My question is to the Premier. Premier, as you know, the community of Horn Payne in Algoma, Manitoulin is about to be thrown into crisis. 146 workers at Halver Street and Becker's Cogen, approximately 40 per cent of the town's population, have just received layoff notices weeks just before the holiday season. Not to mention spin-off jobs with trucking companies, suppliers, lumber and logging companies, who will also be devastated. Speaker, we've talked and talked and talked about the flight of badly needed jobs in the industry in the north. What will this minister do? to help the people of Horn Payne. Mr. Natural Resources and Forestry. Mr. Natural and Speaker, thank you very much, and, uh, and I want to thank the member for the question. We uh, Obviously, Speaker, any time there is a layoff in any industry on this side of the House, we take it very seriously. Uh, any time within my ministry responsible for forestry, we take it very seriously. And one of the reasons we do that, Speaker, is we also understand very clearly that most of the forestry operations in Ontario are in Northern Ontario, and oftentimes those operations that are in Northern Ontario are in very small communities. And as a result of those operations being in very small communities, the layoffs tend to have a disproportionate effect on the communities in which they exist. I would tell my colleague across the floor that we continue to work on the issue. There are partner ministries involved currently that are looking at potential solutions. I'm not here today to promise him in any way that we can find a solution, only that, like with all industries, forestry in this ministry, we continue to work Thanks, on sir. it, and hopefully, Speaker, we can find a resolution on this issue. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Once again, to the Premier, Mr. Speaker, given that the Liberal government's commitment to green energy and the attention paid to climate change, one would think that projects such as this one would be given priority at the highest level. 
The provincial government invested over $30 million just two years ago to open Becker Cogen and keep Hornpain Mill up running. Hornpain depends on these jobs. These jobs depend on a viable long-term energy agreement. Speaker, layoff notices have been issues, issued. There's no more time for talk. Horn Payne needs action. What will the Premier tell the people of Horn Payne leading into this holiday season? Speaker, thank you, and I want to thank the, uh, the member for the follow-up. Speaker, when I answered this question yesterday, I made general reference to the level of support that our government has provided to the forestry industry, something in the order of magnitude of $1.3 billion since the industry first had its challenges beginning in around 06, 07. And I also made reference to the significant level of assistance that we have provided to this company individually as well. Speaker, one example of a program of support that we've provided to forestry generally in the province of Ontario is the roads program. Since we've been in government, we have provided from that one program, Speaker, over $600 million of assistance to forestry-based companies in the province of Ontario. Speaker, that's noteworthy because that program used to be historically a government-run program, but that program was downloaded onto the backs of forestry industry partners by the NDP when they were in government in the early 1990s. Yes, Speaker, we've uploaded that program. We've taken responsibility for it back, over $600 million Thank in you. assistance just on that one particular Thank program you. to forestry companies in the province. Thank you. New question. The member from Durham. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister, this fall, the people of Ontario reached a very noteworthy record. More Ontar Ontarians than ever before registered their consent to become organ and tissue donors. Great. That's more than 89,000 Ontarians over three months wow. who made a selfless commitment to save lives. Truly a great achievement. I have registered to become an organ donor and I, and I always encourage my family and friends to do the same. I know that the residents of Durham understand the importance of organ and tissue donation and that it's an easy way to potentially make a difference in someone else's life. I am glad to hear that so many Ontarians are making this important decision Good. to register as organ and tissue donors. Speaker, through you to the minister, what, what can you tell us about sure. how our province has has reached this very important milestone. Thank you, Minister of Health, Long Term Care. Well, thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Durham, uh, not just for the important question, but for also registering to be a donor. Uh, Mr. Speaker, it was just seven years ago that Ontario opened the Trillium Gift of Life Network, which is, as we all know, a not-for-profit agency managing Ontario's organ and tissue, tissue donation and transplant system. And since its inception, Ontario's organ and tissue donation registration rates have grown significantly. In fact, nearly 1,000 people register to be a donor each and every day in this province, and each person who registers could save up to eight different lives, Mr. Speaker. You can register as an organ donor in person or by mail through Service Ontario. When you go in to renew your health card or your driver's license, or you can do it in, I would say, under two minutes, Mr. Speaker, at beadonor.ca. And today, over three million Ontarians have registered as donors, and I want to take this moment to thank each and every one of them for their incredibly noble decision to potentially save up to eight lives, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Minister. The Trillium Gift of Life Network is an extremely effective and valuable organization creating an easy and convenient process for Ontarians to register as organ donors. I've heard that the Trillium Gift of Life currently has a goal to reach over 233,000 new, new registrations by March 30th, 2016. As of September 30th, they had reached 71% of their goal. I know that we are all here at Queen's Park because we hope to make a positive difference in the life of Ontarians. It is in that spirit that I urge all members on both sides of this House to take a moment out of their day to visit and make the important decision to make a lasting and positive difference. Speaker, through you to the Minister, 
Question. With so many Ontarians registered to become organ donor, organ and tissue donors. What does the current, what does the current need thank you. in Ontario look like? Good, thank you. Minister. Well, thank you again to the member from Durham. Uh, every single day, Mr. Speaker, over 1,600 people in this province are awaiting organ or tissue donation. So, by increasing the number of registered donors, we can reduce the number of lives lost and ease that pain for another family. The good news is that between July and September of this year, Mr. Speaker, 255 separate organ or tissue transplants took place in this province. That's a lot of lives saved and a lot of lives changed thanks to the selfless decisions of Ontarians and their families. So I'll join the member from Durham in encouraging all members of this House, if you haven't already done so, and all Ontarians to take a couple of minutes to go to the website beadonor.ca and register as a vital organ or tissue donor. Thank you. And the question the member from Chatham can ask. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Uh, Premier, our first responders know that seconds matter. Our first responders suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, seconds can feel a lot longer. That's why they're frustrated by the government's stubborn unwillingness to support, excuse me, to support a good idea when they see it. <laughs> Speaker, the Minister of Labour said, and I quote, I'm convinced that we must do a combination of what's envisioned in Bill 2 with some improvements to it. So, Speaker, why won't the minister and the government house leader simply bring Bill 2 to committee where we can amend it and help our heroes with PTSD as soon as possible? Thank you. Premier. Minister of Labour. Sir Labour. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for this question on this very, very important issue. We all know that PTSD is an issue that disproportionately affects frontline workers in this province and throughout this country. We owe it to them to ensure they have the protections in place as well as the coverage in place. Speaker, the, uh, the member referenced Bill 2 that was brought together, that was brought to this House by the member from Parkdale High Park. That, Speaker, is a good bill. That's part of the solution. It's what we need to do is ensure that we have protections in place that not only treat those people that have contracted PTSD, but also ensure we have a system in place that makes sure that we prevent people from getting PTSD in the first place. Speaker, what I want to bring back to this House is a bill that makes Ontario a leader. We're very close to that, Speaker. A lot of people have worked very hard on this, including the first responders themselves. I think what we're going to do, Speaker, is end up leading the country yes, in this, sir. and I'm proud of that. Thank you. Uh, back to the Premier. We already have a bill on the table, as been mentioned, with full opposition support. If you have improvements to the bill, let's do it at committee. Let police officers, firefighters, EMS, personnel and correction officers explain to Ontarians how post-traumatic stress disorder impacts their lives. Instead, you want to introduce your own bill, hold consultations away from the public. Speaker, they're delaying presumptive legislation and first responders of all stripes are tired of waiting. There needs, there's no need to go back to square one. So, Speaker, to the minister, or to the premier, why don't our first responders deserve the chance to share their stories directly with the people that they have sworn to protect? You owe it to them. Let's do it Question. now. Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you once again to, to, the, uh, to the member for that question. I certainly would share the, the end sentiment that he expressed, that we owe it to the first-line responders in this province to ensure that they get the treatment they deserve. They're the people that put their lives on a daily basis on the line for us, and we owe it to them. We understand that. But I'll be very, very frank with you, Speaker. Bill 2, in my estimation, is not good enough for the first responders in this enough. province. We can do better than that. We know how to do better than that. We've brought experts to bear in this issue, Speaker, that are bringing us expertise in this regard. At the end of this process, we're going to have all Answer. the good parts of Bill 2, and we're going to have the prevention aspects in one comprehensive strategy that's going to make this Thank province you. a leader, do something this House will be proud of. Thank you. Member from Scarborough Southwest. Uh, point of order, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, earlier this morning, we had a 
Two of my staff members were here from Scarborough. They don't like coming down here very often, but Maria Faye and Jessica Bozzo, they're here today for some training, and I just wanted to welcome them to the uh, legislature here today. Okay. Thank you. I uh, have two staff members here today as well, Scott and uh, Adam from my constituency office. Unfortunately, we don't have Helen. Her husband passed away suddenly yesterday. Thank you. Thank you. Cambridge. Thank you, Speaker. I have a friend uh, in the West Gallery this morning. He helped me to win my seat. He's a student at Trinity College at U of T, Isaac Wright. Welcome to Queen's Park. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I have four staff members, but they're back in the constituency working. <laughs> I beg to inform the House that I've laid upon the table the 2015 annual report of the Auditor General of Ontario. We have a deferred vote. On the motion to third reading of Bill 115, an act to enact the Representation Act 2015, repeal Representation Act 2005, and to amend the Election Act and Election Finances Act and the Legislative Assembly Act. Call on the members. This will be a five minute bill.
Would all members please take their seats? On December 1, 2015, Madam Mayor, moved third reading of Bill 115. All those in favour, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. Madam Mayor. Madam Mayor. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Ms. Sandals. Ms. Sandals. Mr. Duga. Mr. Duga. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Berardinetti. Mr. Berardinetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Balkas. Mr. Balkas. Ms. Albanese. Ms. Albanese. Mr. Manga. Ms. Manga. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassic. Ms. Jassic. Ms. Darmerla. Ms. Darmerla. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Ms. McMahon. Ms. McMahon. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Ms. Nidu Harris. Ms. Nidu Harris. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Ms. Verniel. Ms. Verniel. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Arna. Mr. Arnott. Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Yurek. Mr. Yurek. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Marteau. Ms. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Pettipiece. All those opposed, please rise one at a time. You're recognized by the clerk. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Vantal. Mr. Vantal. Mr. Novo. Mr. Novo. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Madame Jolinat. Madame Jolinat. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Mr. Montauk. Mr. Montauk. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. The ayes are 74, the nays are 16. The ayes being 74 and the nays being 16, I declare the motion carried. Third reading of the bill, troisième lecture, projet de loi. Be it resolved that the bill do now pass and be entitled as in the motion. We have a deferred vote on the motion of third reading of Bill 106, an act to amend the Condominium Act 1998 and to enact Condominium Management Services 2015 and to amend other acts with respect to condominiums. Call on the members, this will be a five-minute bell.
December 1, 2015, Mr. Rossetti moved third reading of Bill 106. All those in favor of the bill, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Rossetti. Mr. Rossetti. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Madame Mayor. Madame Mayor. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Ms. Sandals. Ms. Sandals. Mr. Duga. Mr. Duga. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Berardinetti. Mr. Berardinetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. McNeekin. Mr. McNeekin. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Balkison. Mr. Balkison. Ms. Albanese. Ms. Albanese. Ms. Manga. Ms. Manga. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassic. Ms. Jassic. Ms. Domerla. Ms. Domerla. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McMahon. Mrs. McMahon. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Mrs. Nidu Harris. Mrs. Nidu Harris. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Ms. Verniel. Ms. Verniel. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Arna. Mr. Arna. Mr. McCloud. Mr. McCloud. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones. Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Miller, Perry Sound, Muskoka. Mr. Miller, Perry Sound, Muskoka. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Yurek. Mr. Yurek. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Marteau. Mr. Marteau. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. You should be song. You should be song. Mr. Vantal. Mr. Vantal. Ms. DeNovo. Ms. DeNovo. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Nadishak. Mr. Nadishak. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Madame Jelina. Madame Jelina. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forster. Ms. Forster. Mr. Shimanta. Mr. Shimanta. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. Those opposed, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. The ayes being 89 and the nays being zero, I declare the motion carried. Third reading of the bill, Twasi lectured, Pojin Lawan. Be it resolved that the bill do now pass and be entitled as in the motion. There are no further there are there are there are no further deferred votes. This House stands adjourned until 3 p.m. this afternoon.